Thank you very much. As I look out in the audience, I'm getting the stare that I normally get as I go and speak places. And I get it everywhere. I go to Australia, they give me the same look that you're giving me. I go to Southeast Asia, they give me the same look you're giving to me. So let's address this elephant that's in the room. You guys are looking at me going, Sebastian, how can you be the speaker? How can you be our speaker tonight? How can you be a CEO of organization? How can you, Sebastian, be a father of four and wife to only one woman? <laughs> So handsome. Hey, that's enough. Those were the final last words I heard before there was multiple guns stuck to my head. I was 17 years old. I was in New York at a nightclub. And at that time, I was a bodyguard to the Chinese mafia boss. And there was, I was across the table from another Chinese mafia boss. And my boss said something wrong to him. He slams his hand table. Everybody stands up. I pull my boss behind me. Uh, the lights come on. The music stop. And there's multiple guns uh, pointing to my head. And they said, Sebastian, get out of the way. We're gonna kill you. I said, no, you're not gonna kill my boss. Kill me. Now I wish I could tell you I was this tough guy, and you know, just like the movies, and I was gonna, you know, but I have been trained in a lot of dangerous stuff. I've been trained boxing, wrestling, biting. I've been trained in my life. <laughs> but even with all that training, I didn't want to die for him. I wanted to die for myself. At 17 years old, I was just tired and I wanted to die. So let me back up and tell you how I got there. Let me back up and tell you how I got to the point there's multiple guns stuck to my head and I just wanted to die. So I came to America with an American stepfather. We moved to a Midwest town, little rural town where my, my family, my mom, myself, and my sister were the only ones that were not Caucasian. This is the early 70s, before most of you were even a thought. <laughs> early 70s. <laughs> it was just me, my sister, my mom, and we went to the school, and by third grade, I grew up with these kids up to third grade, they say, hey, Sebastian, we got this new game. You wanna play? Say, yeah, you're my friends, why not? And all of a sudden, they all left me, and they stood where you're standing. I looked to my left, I looked to my right, where'd everybody go? They said, okay, you ready, Sebastian? They said, China boy, China boy, and they pulled their eyes back, and some of them said, called me a goo, other called me a chink, and I was like, what are those words? And I realized, oh, I'm supposed to chase you. So I started chasing them. But that wasn't the game. The game was, you're not like me. You're not like us. And that day I thought it was really cruel that they would do that. I grew up with these kids. Where did that come from? And then they made it worse. They said, your dad is not your dad. I said, all right, you're crossing the line now. I thought you guys were just jealous of me, making fun of me, because I had a better tan than you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth was, the truth was we were just ending the Vietnam War and there was a lot of hostility. And these kids were just learning what the culture was teaching them. They weren't being evil or malicious. We just didn't have leadership. And that's why we're here today, talking about leadership. See, I learned from that experience. My parents got divorced. Uh, we moved down to another state, bigger city. And I thought I had a great tan. I saw someone else with a better tan. <laughs> the first time in my life, I looked at this man, I said, wow, he has a great tan. <laughs> yes, I saw my first Mexican. <laughs> you guys grew up in a multicultural environment. Mexicans are everywhere. Well, I grew up in the mid-70s. Wow, that was my first Mexican. And I said, man, you got a tan. But you know what? There's something wrong with your eyes. They're too round. <laughs> The kids taught me how to see. If you're not like me, there must be something wrong with you. And then I saw someone else with the ultimate tan. <laughs> yes! I was like, Shazam! <laughs> that tan was the ultimate tan. And I, my first time, my whole life, saw a black person. <laughs> but there was something wrong with him. He was too big and too muscular because I was skinny and scrawny. So there was something wrong with him too. At that moment in time in my life, I was only about junior high, but I realized that people aren't the same. And I heard what the kids say that you're not like me. And I never wanted to hear those words again. And I made a decision, a defining moment at that time, that no one will ever say that you're not like me again. And I want to pause for a minute and say that was a bad decision. Because what I could have heard from those kids was that you're uniquely and wonderfully created, different from me. 
And I can't wait to understand how different you are, how wonderful you are, and different from me. What gift you are to this planet. See, we didn't have what you have here today. We didn't have a form like TEDx where we raise up leaders, student leaders, teachers, leaders in the community who are here today to support the next generation of leaders. Because I didn't have that, I chose to believe what the kids told me, that I was broken because I wasn't like them. So what I did then, I woke up and I decided to put on this mask. I reached out and put on this mask. I said, today, I'm going to be Caucasian. I'm going to be white, because that's what I grew up with. Because I don't want to hear rejection again. So I put on this mask, and here's the problem when you put on a mask. That's your default future. That's your default destiny. Once you put on the mask to say who you're going to be, that's the direction you're going. That's your destiny. And there's no way getting out of it unless you take off that mask. And so I put on this mask to be Caucasian, and I grew up my Caucasian friends, but the big city I was in, they're a little bit different. And I'd watch them, I'd study them, see how they held their books. I'm in junior high, and so I'd hold my books like them, wear clothes like them, I walked up, and I said, cheerio, good day, mate. <laughs> and they all looked at me, what the Christmas are you saying? <laughs> cheerio, mate, good day. I tried too hard. And I sounded like some British, <coughs> Aussie mixed person. <laughs> and they looked at me like I was some weird person. Because to wear a mask, you have to do what they do. So you can have what they have. And you pray one day, hopefully, you can become who they are. But we all know I can never become Caucasian. I'm just too handsome. <laughs> See, that's what the mask does. It makes you want to do what they do so you can have what they have. And one day, hopefully, you become like the mask you're wearing. Well, you know it didn't work out well for me. So I went to the next best tan group. <laughs> and my mother divorced again. I had five uh, uh, stepfathers. I didn't know my biological dad. We grew up in the inner cities. And I was around a whole bunch of Latinos. And so I said, hey, they have a tan like me. We're pretty close. We're family oriented. So I'm going to be a Mexican. I grabbed the mask. I put it on. And I go hang out all my Mexican friends. Now remember, this is the mid-80s. Some of you guys still aren't even a thought in your parents' head yet. In the mid-80s, all the Mexican friends I hung out with were lowriders. <coughs> now some of you guys have to watch TV or movies to remember what lowriders were, but we stole our first uh, uh, Converse shoes and our first dicky pants to be lowriders, to be accepted, to be in, because you have to do what they do so you can have what they have, and one day maybe I could become a Mexican. And so, Stealing shoes, pants, that wasn't a big problem. I was okay with that. But there's one thing that bothered me. Now listen, I've spoken everywhere. I've spoken all over the United States, all over the most of the world, Asia, Australia. I have not found any Mexicans being able to help me with this next thing I'm about to show you. So if you understand what happened to me, if you understood what I did, please talk to me afterwards and explain to me. I still need counseling, okay? Stealing the shoes, wearing the pants, no problem. But we did this thing as Mexicans and it just boggled me. We put our hand in our pants. <laughs> We'd look up. <laughs> and I'd say, I think to myself, what, what are we looking at? <laughs> so, doctor, it wasn't in the morning, definitely wasn't the sun. I'm like, what are we looking at? <laughs> but you know, I didn't want to ask the guys next to me because I'm afraid they'd say, hey, Sebastian, shut up. You're not one of us. And get rejected. So I kept that mask tight on. I did what they did so I could have what they have, hopefully one day become Mexican. But looking up wasn't the problem. I had my hands like way down my pants. I was thinking, why is my hand down my pants? I wouldn't ask anybody because I was afraid I wouldn't be like them. Well, obviously that didn't work out too well because as much as I could do, I couldn't, and much as I accumulated to have, dress like them, act like them, speak like them, eat like them, I couldn't become a Mexican. Well now, in the mid 80s, the Vietnam War is over, they immigrating people to America, and this big city I was in, some Vietnamese people start coming into the city. <clears throat> and I said, well, I know I'm half Vietnamese and half Chinese, let's try and be Vietnamese. So I put on this Vietnamese mask, hung around all the Vietnamese people, and then I, um, first time in my life, I used chopsticks. And I lost like 20 pounds. <laughs> they taught me how to eat food that I've never eaten before. When you eat fish, the head's still on the plate. I was like, wow, that's interesting. 
I ate so many different foods I never ate before. I would do what I needed to do so I could have their acceptance, so I have what they have, so one day maybe I'll be Vietnamese. So I don't mind eating food I never ate before. <clears throat> I didn't mind losing 20 pounds or learning how to use chopsticks. But I think forks and spoons just get you there quicker. <laughs> but one thing I did as a Vietnamese person still boggles me to this day. I don't understand why we did it. And again, if you can help me afterwards and tell me, you might help me a lot of counseling fees and money, okay? <laughs> so as Vietnamese, and we're little gangsters, right? Because there's only five of us in the whole school and everybody else, you know, is like beating up on us because we're skinny, 100 pound nerds, right? <clears throat> well, let me speak about my other four friends. I was 105 pound. <laughs> I was a tough one. <clears throat> but we would smoke cigarettes and would sit on the ground Ooh, I'm almost embarrassed to do this. We'd sit on the ground like this. Though he's back there, you might want to stand up because this is hilarious. We'd sit on the ground like this and smoke a cigarette. I'm too old, I can barely do it. But I would practice, we call the Asian squat. The Koreans mastered this, they call it the kimchi squat. I'm Americanized, I didn't know what kind of squat that was. I would go in the room and practice in the mirror and I'd fall. My muscles are not flexible like that. I was not born that way. We have these things in America called tables and chairs. Why are we squatting on the floor having a cigarette? The worst part is people walk by on their butts in my face. We're trying to act cool, but we look stupid. I was like, why would I do that? Because I lived into my default destiny. Because once I put on that mask, I had to be whatever I said that mask is. And that's my default destiny. There's no way out of it. I had to do what they do to have what they have. And one day maybe I'll become them, which I never did. Because I'm uniquely and wonderfully created different. So the a speed up this, since we only have 18 minutes, that default mask I was wearing got me arrested for the fifth and final time. See, that scene at the bar, it made me not a bodyguard, it turned me into a mafia boss. But that fake mask I was wearing being Chinese, that fake mask I was wearing being a mafia boss, it had its default destiny. And you know where that goes when you live that lifestyle. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. And you know where that went? I got arrested for the fifth final time, I was 19 years old. My fake names no longer matter. That last charge, I was sitting in prison, looking at life. And at that moment, I had three thoughts come to my mind. The three thoughts that came to my mind helped me take off this mask to be who I truly was. The first thought is this, I'm already in. Hey, why am I trying to be like everyone else? I'm already in. The author of this grand story already created this big story that's already moving before I was born, created me, dropped me into the story and said, hey, be Sebastian. I'm already in. So why am I trying to be like everyone else? He, he created me, put me in this grand epic story so that I could be what? Painting on the canvas of eternity with my expression to show how great this author is. I'm already accepted. So if I had leadership like this in this room, back then, instead of saying, hey, those kids aren't making fun of you because you're different, they're noticing how unique and wonderful you are. I'm already in. I don't have to try anymore. I don't have to do so I can have and maybe one day become. I'm already there. I am me. Da -da. <laughs> and all I had to do is express myself on this canvas of eternity with my unique paintbrush, strokes, and my expression. Then, you know, prison is a pretty good place for people who need time out. Because then I thought, wow, if I'm already in, then I bet you I can. I can do it. I can do whatever I want to do because that's the passion in my heart, not your heart. See, I, you, you just had three doctors speak before me. Do I look like a doctor? <laughs> I know, you're too handsome. Yes, I can be a doctor. But I don't want to be a doctor. But that's what my mom said she brought me to America for. Be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, then you'd be happy you got the American dream. I couldn't do any of those things. I went to prison. Is there a category for that? It's called thug life. I really didn't want to be that. I got there from my default destiny with my mask. But you know what I always wanted to do? It was natural all along the way. I made money for the Mexican mafia. 
for the Chinese mafia, Vietnamese mafia. I made money for all of them because I'm a natural leader. I know I inspire people. I see systems. I can scale businesses. That's why I was uniquely created by this author who designed me and dropped me into this story. And so that passion I have to raise up other leaders, I can do it. This is my passion. Your passion to be a musician, your passion to be an artist, your passion to be a lawyer, a doctor. We have three doctors before me. They're each uniquely, distinctly different. So if you're called to be a pastor, a doctor, a lawyer, a musician, you can. Because that's the passion on your heart. You want to hear how uniquely different you are? You, 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 my friend, are one out of 400. One out of 400 million. You're the one sperm that made it to the egg. <laughs> That's much medical doctor I know, sorry. You're the one out of 400 million swimmer that made it hit back. You did it. That's how unique you are. You can because that's what's the passion on your heart because you're different from everyone in this room. And here's the other cool fact. You know why you can? What separates humans from animals is that humans can do two things animals cannot. Humans can be creative and humans have a free will. That's why you can do it. You can be creative. You can think out of the box. Did you hear those geniuses before me? Shazam, they thought way out of the box. Let's put a magnet in someone's head and help them out. <laughs> Man, I just fell asleep on remote control. I feel better. <laughs> that was amazing. They're geniuses. <laughs> the point is this. You can. Because you have creativity and a free will to make a choice. And that's why you could do that passion on your heart. Don't put on a mask. Be accepted by society. You're more significant if you have more money. More significant if you dress this way. More significant if you have this. You're more significant if you live there. That's not the truth. And when you pursue someone else's dream, I pursued my mom's American dream, and I failed. I put on those masks, and I was stuck to a default destiny of wherever that mask is taking me. I would encourage you to take, take off the mask. First, say you're in. Say it with me, you're in. You're in. Okay, I'm sorry. I meant, I'm you say you're in. You say, I'm in. You say, I'm in. I'm in. Second, you can say, I can. I can. And the third thing, take off this mask, you have to say, I count. I count. You count. Listen, if you didn't show up tonight, guess what? We would miss your laugh. We would miss your body heat keep us warm in this cold weather. <laughs> if you didn't show up, we would miss you. And because you did show up, we're laughing with you and sometimes at you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You count. I count. Whatever I choose to do, I impact. It's like that ripple effect. The water going, uh, the pebble going in the water, it just ripples out. You affect yourself, others around you, your school, your family, your city, then the world. You count. Wow! I don't have to wear that mask. You mean I'm already significant? I'm in. You mean I can do as passion on my heart even though it's kind of maybe contrarian or a counterculture? Because I can. I was created wonderfully and uniquely. And finally, I count. Ladies, if you didn't show up tonight, who would the men look at? Mm. And men, if you didn't show up tonight, who would the women say no to? <laughs> you count. Right? You count. So I want to close with this. When you put on a mask and try to be somebody that you're not, you're hiding your uniqueness and wonderful difference. The diversity that we should be celebrating. And not giving away our diversity for conformity. We need to celebrate our difference. When you put on that mask, you have a default destiny. You can't control it. You're on that track, wherever that mask is taking you. But if you take off your mask by believing that you're in, you can and you count. When that mask comes off and you get to express yourself and paint your, all of your expressions on the canvas of eternity, guess what? Opportunities, possibilities are endless. My question to you is this. How are you going to design your destiny now that your mask is off? Thank you.